my friends, the great experiment. The crew doesn't hate the XO, then he's not doing his job. Good hunting is what you say. It's part of the pattern, part of the plan. Are they the lucky ones? That's what you're thinking, isn't it? Welcome to Greatest Trek. Hot Cylon Summer. It's a new Star Trek podcast from the makers of The Greatest Generation, currently covering Season 1 of Battlestar Galactica 2004. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica. Oh boy, you had a great weekend, didn't you? I could just tell. I could tell by looking at your shiny face. Shiny as a silver spoon. Ugh, I don't know what that means. (laughs) You were texting me pictures of Bottles of creme de banane. I don't go back to Seattle that much, and I feel like when I do, it's right where I left it, like basically the same. Mm -hmm. But this time was cool because we went to some different places, like some different bars and restaurants, and that was exciting. (laughs) I played golf every day with my buddy Ty, which was obnoxious. What I told my wife was, uh, it's not a golf trip, but it's also not not a golf trip. I just woke up at the crack of dawn every morning, went to play, and then I had the rest of my day and my evening to hang out with friends. And that was what it was for four straight days. It was hotter in Seattle than it was in LA, which I didn't enjoy. Yeah. Were you staying with friends or in a hotel? Yeah, I was staying with my buddy Phil, uh, which is a a place I I typically stay when we're up there. Yeah, That guy's got central air. Oh yeah, you know it. (laughs) Big, big fun. But that's rare in Seattle. Like, you, if, if you're staying with a friend in Seattle, that could be no fun on a very hot weekend. You and I are notoriously enthusiastic about a bar called Cannon up there. Mm-hmm. And I was riding for a Cannon trip hard. Yeah. But the group dynamic altered us into a place called a Doctor's Office. Okay, okay. And it is like... An eight seat micro bar up there. <laughs> Premium cocktail game. Micro bar was uh, my nickname in college, by the way. <laughs> A lot of familiar faces uh, working behind the bar there. Oh, cool. It was really fun to spend some time in a place like that. A dark, cold place on a very hot day. Yeah. Just a delight. So, yeah, I had a great trip to Seattle. One of those trips where on the plane home, me and my wife are like, let's just like clean it up this week. <laughs> and with that being said, uh, tonight we're going to Magic Castle. So, Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's try to keep this body alive for one more week is the idea. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I, all, on the other hand, said goodbye to my wife on Friday. She went off to Croatia for a uh, birthday trip for her mom and sort of uh, on the heels of uh, saying goodbye to her, immediately came down with a three-day bout of food poisoning that I endured while solo dadding a less than two-year-old child. <laughs> That's what's wrong with Ben this week? What's wrong with Ben this time? That's what's wrong with Ben this week, yeah. If I look 10 pounds lighter, I might be. (laughs) Croatia's such an interesting choice for celebrating a mother-in-law's birthday, like, uh, is Croatia, give birthday potato to (laughs) mother-in-law. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it sounds great. It sounds like they're having a ton of fun. It sounds like it might be even hotter than Seattle is right now. Impossible. But I'm jealous on so many levels. Are you feeling 100 again? Or are you still feeling uh, in it? No, I think as of last night, I'm back to 100. percent Like yesterday, I had my my sad desk salad for lunch. Uh huh. And this is a salad I make three times a week, and I made made it about halfway through a salad that I I've taken to the dome hundreds of times. I got to the halfway point, and I was like, I think I'm full. <laughs> Wow. It wasn't sick full. It was just like, I think my stomach has shrunk that much. Yeah. Well, you got to ride that shrunken stomach wave. Yeah. Ben, don't stretch that thing out. No. I should sign up for a, like a high impact interval training class like right now so I can really shred off the pounds. <laughs> well, you know a cabbage salad is the poppers of a shrunken stomach. Right. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, I, uh, I loosened everything up, and uh, I'm ready to go. And, man, I'm jealous that you're going to the Magic Castle. <laughs> yeah, passage just fell into our lap, so. Nice. Going to do it again and, and be amazed. It's always amazing. Well, uh, it seems like we both went through trials for our bodies, mm. something that would test our flesh and our bones mm. in different ways. And maybe there's a third way to test the flesh and bone. And uh, today's episode of uh, Battlestar Galactica, it's season one, episode eight, Flesh and Bone. I am God. Wow. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Bone, 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 bone. <laughs> meet you on the Audrey. <laughs> I'm sure you've had this. I think this is not uncommon. What I'm talking about is the bad NyQuil dream. You need to take some drugs just to sleep. Yeah. Because, God, yeah. you're feeling sick. Like, any sleep will do, and you'll take whatever drugs are necessary to do it. And when I, whenever I take NyQuil to do this, holy moly, I'm having a Chamala dream the way President <laughs> Roslin is having. Yeah. The nightmarish image of, uh, of Callum Keith Rennie getting swept back into the forest very reminiscent of uh an episode of uh, quantum leap we re recently watched with our buddy dan mccoy for a bonus episode the callum keith renniness of leoban Kanoi, not something we've mentioned up until now and i think a part of it is that i find that he really disappears into this role like if you're familiar with his work from star trek discovery you might not even recognize him yeah, I definitely didn't the first time we spotted him in the uh, in the pilot. Like when they take the sign off of the easel and, and reveal his bloated purple corpse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I'm never at the post office seeing the like the police sketches pasted on the wall and going like, I'm going to keep my eye out for that guy because I know I know myself. I know I'm never going to spot a guy. Hey, man, here's an idea that I just came up with as you were describing this. Why aren't there wanted poster stamps? Yeah, you know. Like, that gets be... the word out, right? Or, mm -hmm. like, missing child. Like, hey, hey, Amber Alert, stamp style. Yeah. No? Is that a bad idea? I mean, maybe when you're, like, a business that's getting, a like, a direct mail campaign together, you don't want to, <laughs> like, associate yourself with the abduction of a minor. <laughs> It's time to donate to KEXP again. Oh. <laughs> huh. <laughs> well, now I'm sad for another reason. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should be diverting my resources to something <laughs> that fucking matters. <laughs> uh, I heard him get called uh, Conroy and Kanoy. I'm pretty sure that the president calls him Conroy, Mr. Conroy at one point. He's another copy of the man you knew as Leo Ben Conroy. And yet, you look at his name written. Yeah. I mean, far be it for us to criticize a pronunciation or a name changing names over the course of several episodes. Yeah. You see this guy jerked out of frame in, in President Rosalind's dream. He's there. And then he's dragged away from her. She's she's running through the forest. She's running from a bunch of soldiers. Right. Leoban is like, hey, hide with me near this tree. And then he gets jerked away, and then she wakes up. And assistant cousin Greg has uh, the news that a Cylon has been found aboard another ship. She's, she's not opening the door. She's uh, claiming side effects from drugs and uh, he's very understanding about that this is not a sexy dream either no like it's a wake up wet but it's not the nice kind of wake up wet i was just gonna say sleeping hot the worst kind of sleep yeah and president Roslin has got it all over her chest in a really bad way <laughs> it, this looks like it sucks yeah i've never had a uh, a wet nyquil dream have you it seems like those two things don't go together yeah, well, I guess uh, like because cold season is usually when it's it's uh, cold out. Yeah, but um, yeah, what night quill dream? Hmm, maybe that's like amazing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should try harder. Yeah, 
Like maybe that's like where H.R. Giger got all his ideas. He had like one wet NyQuil dream and the rest is history. I just watched Jodorowsky's Dune like recently, <laughs> like last week. Oh, wow. Great movie. HR is exactly who you'd think he'd be. <laughs> yeah. Like like before they, they put on the lower third name, I'm like, oh, I wonder if, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that movie's pretty famous, but like when it came out, I happened to see a screening of it like early enough that I like tweeted something about it back in the good old days of Twitter. And like one of the producers of the movie was like, hey, thanks for saying something nice about our movie and like followed me. And like we became like people who would tweet at each other from time to time. And I was like, who the fuck am I? You're like, you made a cool movie. Why do you care about me? I'm nobody. Haven't you done that on social media, though? Someone says something nice about you and then uh, you uh, doff the social media cap yeah. and follow. Yeah, I think so. I, I hope so. I mean. I don't. I never did anything as cool as Yodorowsky's Dune. Speaking of Dune, I was around the corner at a coffee shop just yesterday, and the barista was like, "You know who you look like?" And I just like purse my <laughs> lips and I swallow really hard. And he's like, "That guy from Dune." And I, <laughs> and I was like, which, "That is so non-specific now." <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, "Which Dune?" And he's like, the bad one. <laughs> I reject that characterization. Do you get that a lot? I do get that a lot. <laughs> Good looking man, that Kyle McLaughlin. Try looking into that place where you dare not look. You will find me there staring back at you. Speaking of good looking men, I was blown away at the non-dead headshot that they now have of Leob and Kanoi. Yeah. You know, you see this in, in like the file that the president gets and like the file that Adama has. Like everybody's got this like huge, glossy eight by ten actor headshot, basically, of the character Leo Benoy. Where'd they get this? Did they take this picture of him when they found him? I think so often you get like the file photo of a person in movies and TV. What is this? Yeah. This isn't like closed circuit television screen grab or something. This is a posed photo. Yeah. It doesn't read mugshot the way I feel like it kind of should. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, assistant cousin Greg is telling President Roslin, we got another Leoben Kanoi, and he's over on the Geminon Traveler ship. Yeah. They, they start talking about what to do about this. Adama does not want him interrogated. He just wants him destroyed, basically. First of all, it's not a him, it's an it. Second, anything it says cannot be trusted. The president is curious to hear what he's got to say and overrules Big Adama on what they're going to do with him. She wants somebody to go over there and interrogate him and they discuss the fact that this guy is a master dissembler and is going to, you know, run them around in circles and the president doesn't give a shit. She wants this done. It's interesting how all of this points back to that initial moment and all that time Commander Adama spent with a Cylon like this, this exact yeah. Cylon, and how it's really his word against everyone else's based on that experience. His feelings are strong. Yeah. And because Roslyn doesn't know what that was like, she's being very presidential about this. Like, let's get some information while we have the opportunity. And because she's the president, that's what's going to happen. It goes to Starbuck, who in her convalescence has sort of uh, focused all of her energy on figuring out this Cylon Raider that they captured. She's even got like a orange jumpsuit of flight operations people on and uh, she's talking to Big Adama about how they figured so much of what the different meats inside the ship do. They're really starting to get the hang of this thing. There should be a butcher case series of little signs on metal forks in there for like <laughs> throttle, <laughs> roll, mm -hmm. yaw, yeah. guns. And then right below that, how much per pound. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Oh, the guns, it's a nice fatty cut, you know, beautiful marbling. 
I love this scene for the relationship between Adama and Starbuck because Adama is giving serious warnings to Starbuck about what this individual is capable of. And her sarcastic pushback is meant to kind of lighten the mood. And there's that power that comes from her expression being as jocular as it was until he leaves. And then she like kind of goes cold again to think about all these warnings she just heard about what she's going to have to do. Right. Just be careful. Be careful. Be careful. He has an agenda. When we come back, Boomer is hanging out in the same spot. Almost seems like she's contemplating getting her sexual needs met by this Cylon radar now that uh, things are off between her and T-Roll. How easy would it be for her to get up in that Cylon radar? There's a lot of like stroking of its wings and stuff yeah. that Boomer does, but she never ever gets near the hole. I think that's an important distinction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you describe what's going on here. She's very on the outside of it. Yeah, I mean, the, there's some foreplay to it, though, you yeah. know? She seems to be humming a sort of lullaby to this ship when uh, Chief Tyrrell notices both the song and her strange relationship to this ship, and uh, she says she's a Cylon as kind of a relationship trick, kind <laughs> of a I'm dating someone else kind of play. Yeah. He doesn't find this funny. Not amusing to him. No. Oh. It sucks to have a workplace relationship where after the breakup, there's no separation. You know, you're just going to encounter this person over and over again. Right. It is still very awkward. They both have to be on the flight deck from time to time. Yeah. I mean, this is probably part of why the Battlestar has this policy in place. Yeah. Yeah. So Starbuck flies a Raptor over to the Geminon Traveler. Uh, to see Leoben Kanoi, and he's being kept in a storage room, which we heard through dialogue, and I expected to be like the makeout space that uh, that Chief Tyrrell used. This is an enormous storage room. Yeah, and they don't seem to be storing anything in it, crucially. Except a very sweaty Leoben Kanoi, and this is a trait that Starbuck and the guard stationed outside sort of comment on, like, look at all that sweat. It's almost as if he had a, you ever have a, a bad night of sleep because you've taken like some cold medication and you've had some <laughs> weird dreams? <laughs> oh yeah, and it's really hot outside. <laughs> that'll that'll giger anyone. Yeah. Right up. That'll giger your chest. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a moment where like both she and the guard are kind of impressed with this Cylon technology like, Wow, they even got the sweat right. Yeah. Look at how real it looks. And check out that guy's party shirt. Yeah. He's a robot man, but like he's kind of got a sense of style. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That pattern is really complicated. That's my exact style. He's wearing a complicated shirt on top of a couple of other shirts also. And I think that's why you're sweating, guy. Yeah, that's that's why you're sleeping on that couch in the middle of a business meeting. On and on this conversation outside goes. How did he choose this shirt? Why did he choose this shirt? How many more shirts are there in his closet? Should we start there? Like, should we go to his quarters and toss it? Not just in his closet, but if he started taking off shirts, like how how many would he have to take off before he was bare chested? Because it seems, I mean, it seems like there may be four at minimum they cut back into the storage room and Leoben Kanoi is, is doing squats and he's like could I be wearing any more shirts <laughs> I mean no wonder he's fucking sweating yeah gods they go through a lot of trouble to imitate people he appears to be sleeping when Starbuck appears to wake him up and she gets right to the questions but he doesn't want to answer any questions except the question about her name and back and forth it goes. She has questions. He wants her name. She's not giving it. They talk about sabotage and they talk about the differences in their cosmologies really quickly. Like that he is a monotheist and that she is a polytheist and all that like works its way in really quickly. And she gets quite fed up with all the games he's playing and gets ready to 
hobble her way back out of the room when he guesses who she is. He uh, suggests that she might be Starbuck. And I was a little surprised that she betrayed that he nailed it Mm -hmm. as easily as she did, given what we know about her as a poker player. There are a couple of moments in this scene that betray her in that same way. Yeah, it's interesting. What are you doing? (laughs) This kicks off a real fucking with each other contest that continues throughout the episode. Sure does. And it feels like it's the reason why Starbuck was chosen for this mission. I think there were several moments in this episode where you're made to think as a viewer, like, why Starbuck of all people? Yeah. And I think that's because she's a very skilled fucker with you (laughs) as a person. You know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They could have sent Gaius Baltar over there and totally scrambled this guy's program, though. Yeah. But I mean, like, it would have been scramble on scramble crime at that point. Yeah. He reveals that he has put a nuke on one of the ships in the fleet and it will go off at 1830 hours. We don't know what time it is right now. So it seemed like it was like meant to start a ticking clock for us, but Mm -hmm. I was just like, okay. (laughs) I'm all right with that being a mystery because it seems like this is throughout the normal course of daytime business. I mean, if it's 1830, it seems like dinner time or something like that's going to be that evening. And not only that, there is a protocol involved whenever uh you hear nuke you've got to say nuke to your commanding officer and uh in the cic we see what adama does with this information he snaps the fleet into action based on this intelligence that starbucks got and that means radiological sweeps of all the ships in the fleet but just be chill about it you know like the (laughs) chillest possible radiological sweeps they're just normal they're just what we do anyway on a Tuesday, right? Yeah. We should build this into our, our routine, honestly. Starbucks a little shaken up that Kanoi knew what her name was, and she gets a little pep talk from Adama to like, hey, keep it together. Like he's presumably been in hiding a long time and we just shook him loose because we revealed that photograph of his corpse a couple of days ago. So Like, he could have heard any radio broadcast anywhere. Mm -hmm. Really a missed opportunity of having a three-way call, but not a triptych image Mm. of them on screen. Those are so much fun. That would have been fun, yeah. And then, like, do the Seinfeld bit where they, you know, are trying to, like, switch over to the other line and, like, revealing something accidentally to the, the person that they think they're talking to. You know, I could hear you on the other line. They blurp out President Roslin and they blurp in Clint Howard talking about the great value of Bob's big boy. (laughs) (laughs) She heads back in and boy, it gets theological again real quick. Kanoi says that he's going to reveal something about Starbucks future to her, but you know, he has a plan for how this interrogation is going to go and It's not time for him to make that revelation yet. Kind of a weird time to bring in a tray of food when this thing hits the table. Yeah. (laughs) And like, it seems like they're bringing her lunch. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I thought it was for her the entire time. And the the point being like when she guzzles that water down. Yeah. You see how, how much he's been sweating. He really, I mean, his programming seems to indicate that he needs those electrolytes. Yeah. But uh, she takes it to the dome. When you're ensign hospitality, though, you got to be a little bit more on the ball about like what's going on in the interrogation at the moment when you choose to bring the tray. Because he's been talking about like seeing the face of God and knowing madness. It's like, <laughs> it's like eh, maybe don't interrupt at that moment. When Starbuck offers Leoben Kanoi her leftovers, it made me wonder about 
about how much worse torture can be if you've been tortured less than 30 minutes after eating. Like there's that <laughs> extra level. Oh yeah, yeah. Of feeling bad. Your parents always say like, don't jump into the torture chamber when you've just yeah. had a hot dog or whatever. So diabolical. <laughs> <laughs> What's your thinking here? Oh yeah, she's playing 3D chess, baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How's your lunch? Machines shouldn't feel pain, shouldn't bleed, shouldn't sweat, shouldn't, shouldn't sweat. Were you surprised at how few times she asked him where the bomb was? No, because it seemed like at every turn he was very specifically interested in changing the subject into this religious screed over and over again, right? Yeah, I guess so. He gets to uh, eat some of her woodier mushrooms, maybe, then gets a surprise pistol whip to the side of his head. And this is where the violence of this interrogation kind of kicks off and kind of where <laughs> I started having a tough time enjoying this one. You know, there, there's a lot of talk about, like, he's a machine, so he should be able to, like toggle the pain switch and you know to some extent he leaves that mysterious and to some extent he tells her to bring on the pain uh he can take as much as she can dish out which are two things that are acting in conflict but man i hated seeing this and i just (laughs) just didn't like watching one of the many conflicts in this scene is starbucks insistence that leoben canoy can hit the switch inside himself to turn off the ability to feel this. And at different points in this interrogation scene, that appears to happen. Like when his face is underwater in the water bucket later, when he's able to break from his restraints later and flip over the table, like this is, this is something that he is enduring by choice. Right. And it seems to be confirming Starbucks suspicion the whole time. So, I can understand that it is uh, uncomfortable to watch someone who is presenting as a human being uh, show pain in the face of torture, but I think this episode does let you off the hook a little bit in confirming that this is a Cylon who is making a choice to fuck with Starbuck. I guess so, yeah. I I kept thinking about the 2004-ness of this also and the like post-9-11 debate that we never should have had about whether torture was okay. And it felt like, um, not irresponsible, but like it was touching a third rail for me, the discussion of whether or not someone is human and therefore deserving of, you know, basic civil liberties. I I think it was just hitting as a little too real for me in both the historical context that this episode came out in and also in our modern context. Would you have had the same feelings if in Survivors they had to interrogate Kevin Uxbridge? Because this is like the Cylons genocided or attempted to genocide humanity. Yeah. For which there is no law to fit their crime. Yeah, but it also doesn't seem like this guy was in charge of that, you know? Well, that's also another interesting point in that, like, this episode, we learn about a kind of transference that happens between, you know, about to die and dead Cylons into other Cylons that wake up again with those traits in them. Yeah. It is a curious thing. Yeah. And I mean, you make a a very compelling point. There's like a trolley problem here where Mm -hmm. there's one guy who may or may not even be experiencing anguish on one track and all humans on the other track. Right, yeah. (laughs) But uh, yeah, this is where the torture kicks off and it basically doesn't stop for the rest of the episode. So I was glad when we cut over to Baltar getting a nice shoulder rub, you know? Give me a reprieve. Always a fun time with Gaius Baltar. He's in the lab and in walks Boomer. Boomer wants to be one of the first people tested with his new Cylon testing device. And when he pushes back on that idea for a bit, she tells him that he owes her. Because you might remember (laughs) back on Caprica, she sacrificed Hilo and his spot 
on her ship so that uh, he could stay. Actually, Hilo probably did that himself, right? More than she ever did. Yeah, but like, as far as either of them know, Hilo's not around to cash this chip in, so she's going to. Right. Unfortunately, this device isn't quite ready for prime time, but in terms of beta testing, he'll keep her in mind. Is it beta or beta? Is it Kanoi or Conroy? Oh, we'll never know. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Talking about mispronunciation, what else do we even do? <laughs> Back on Cylon occupied post coital Caprica, Boomer lets Hilo rest. Well, a number six talks shit about her to Aaron Doral. Aaron Doral kind of defends her. Aaron Doral's such an interesting character. Like among the group of Cylons that are observing and talking, he seems to be the least emotional mm -hmm. about the circumstances. He kind of defends Boomer to this number six down there. And then Boomer rolls in to give them an update about how things are going. And she does this in the way someone tells their friend group about a new flame. Like, <laughs> we've gone out a few times. Things are going pretty good. We had a sleepover. He dumped in me. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that maybe Six hates Sharon because now Sharon did a seduction and that's Six's bag. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but there's something so much less seductive about this version of number six, you know? Yeah. This number six looks like she's dressed to work in a laboratory. Right, she's slinking substantially less. Yeah. This boomer is told that there's a love nest being set up for her and Hilo. Yeah. You think they got the heart-shaped bed and everything? <laughs> Put a couple quarters in to get it vibrating. Yeah. Like you go to a video arcade and it's uh, like the keys been hit on the cabinets. It's like... Oh, man. Hell yeah. Free play heart-shaped bed is what they got. Yeah. Yeah. I think they better tone it down. If that's what they made over there. So the, the orders that Sharon is given is like, go find that with him and propose a settle down. Like if, if he's in love with you, like see if you can now convince him to start a new life on Cylon occupied Caprica. And uh, if he's not into that, uh, go ahead and knock him off. Yeah, it's a real uh, marry or die situation <laughs> in progress here. Yeah, she already did the fuck. So she runs back to Hilo while a bunch of flashbacks play of their relationship as she's running toward him. And when she arrives, she tells him how urgently they need to go. And that's because Cylons are on the way. And I love how her description could be very true. You know, <laughs> it could be those Cylons that she just talked to about the love nest. Yeah. And she says that the ones that are coming are like way worse than anything they've encountered so far. And that's sort of also true. Yeah. Yeah. How's Leob and Kanoi doing? Back on the Geminon Traveler, we find out he's been pretty roughed up. And uh, roughed up enough for Starbuck to do the interrogation once more. She excuses the guards, and that leaves them alone the, at the table. And the temperature in the room absolutely changes here because while they're alone, he tells her that he could kill her so fast, so easy, because I'm a robot man. And there is a moment here that is a lot like the one you described earlier, Ben, when he says this to her and the angle is on her kind of in profile and you see her swallow, that's the tell. Mm -hmm. When she swallows and then asks, why don't you? That's telling you that she's nervous. Yeah, he goes ahead and uh, puts his cards on the table. I like how fast this happened because... You couldn't even tell he was breaking out of restraints he broke out so fast. Yeah. I had the laugh at the like, I mean, these were very beefy boys that ran up to grab him and, and pull mm -hmm. him off of her after he slams her against the wall and tries to choke her out. But I was like, he just broke a bunch of metal with his bare hands. Like, how are two beefy boys going to hold him down? It's because he's making choices. And that's another aspect to this that's so interesting. Like... He chooses to act like he's hurt. He chooses to act like he's being waterboarded. He chooses to make these soldiers think that they could actually physically restrain him. Yeah. It's bizarre. Yeah. So uh, Big Adama is down in the morgue and checks out the other Mr. Conroy. 
Did you feel like for a second this Leoban would wake up? I had such a weird tingle watching the slab get rolled out with this guy <laughs> on it. I was like, are we sure he's dead? Could we ever really know? Yeah, could he jump up and grab Adama just the, the same way? The way that a Cylon Raider is both asleep and awake yeah. on the flight deck. I had this thought that maybe the nuke was in the body also. Love that idea. Wow, yeah. You know, and maybe they don't do a... a radiological scan in the morgue because why would you or something good punch up but uh colonel ty calls and says that they've they've been scanning their asses off nuclear wise and there is no news but in a chill way right yeah like real casual yeah (laughs) and they have two hours left before this thing is supposed to go off and adama orders them to spread the fleet out so that if one of the ships does explode it doesn't cause too much damage to the other ones. I love how you never get the react here to two very curious orders by Adama to the fleet. Like, Mm -hmm. you're on some random ship, me and you, and we're like, yeah, so the order came down, uh, just your typical radiological exam, nothing to see here, and then a couple hours later, yeah, we've been ordered to spread out pretty far. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. I'm not going to try to connect the dots because <laughs> I think I might shit myself. Yeah. How much time remaining? Time remaining. Two hours, nine minutes. Back in the interrogation room, a very specific size of bucket of water is brought in. I wrote extremely specific bucket in my notes, but very specific works for me. It's sort of the perfect size of bucket. I yeah. couldn't take my eyes off of it. Like, you go on a list if you buy this bucket, right? <laughs> <laughs> because it's so perfectly head-sized? Yeah. Well, here's the thing about this bucket. You want it head-sized, but shoulder-sized, especially. Yeah, it's it's head and shoulder-sized, and it's also got that lip so that two prison guard dudes can carry it across the room pretty easily. If anyone out there works for head and shoulders, I think this is an interesting merch idea for them. Put your mark on this too, you know? (laughs) When he does not struggle as he's submerged, it is another moment where you just see him fucking with her. And this moment gives Starbuck an idea that she didn't walk into the room with before. And that is maybe this guy is too far away from the other Cylons for that consciousness transference theory to happen. And maybe death, were it to happen in this room to Leoban Convoy, would be permanent. Yeah. And she thinks by gassing him up in this way, he will become nervous or whatever. If he's nervous, that is not something that he demonstrates here. No, he gets like dumped out on the floor wet and starts recounting basically like her psychological profile like what was traumatic in her childhood how her mom thought suffering like gave people character so (laughs) she like subjected her to tons of suffering the very last thing that you should do when you're arguing with someone is bring up a bunch of old childhood shit that you think you know about them (laughs) as a way to argue your own point that doesn't really work does it Yeah, it seems to get under her skin, though, but not in a way that's going to be helpful to Leoben. We see this over and over in movies and TV, and I just want to call this out. The shot where you put a camera below a transparent piece of glass or whatever and have someone's face in water face that camera. I just love that stuff. Yeah, every swirly scene in a movie. It's great. I feel like there's probably one in Fight Club when somebody is like icing a a face wound. I regret in all my time doing corporate media, I never got the chance to do that kind of shot. Yeah, why why can't the CEO of (laughs) Giant Airplane Corporation, why can't we see a turd coming out, you know? If anyone deserves uh, that kind of treatment. <laughs> so over in Gaius Baltar's lab, uh, they're running the first test of the Cylon detector, and they're using a test strip that Boomer has given them. And you got to pay attention to how this scene is blocked. 
because the monitors are facing Gaius Baltar mm -hmm. and there's Boomer on the other side being like, what's it say? <laughs> and he is looking at not just one red or green light, but like 25 red lights on his screen yeah. blinking very brightly. It'd be like if if the little like COVID test was like, you know, as long as a ruler and there were like 50 little, <laughs> little stripes. <laughs> I got to believe this is like the beta test version of the software that's like, oh yeah, like the more lights, the better. Mm -hmm. Light it up. Yeah. And the tension in this scene is that he's seeing all these red lights and she isn't. And he is scrambling much in the same way as he tried to destroy the computer that, that may have had his closed circuit television picture on it that was being enhanced. He's sort of slapping the monitor and mashing his fingers into the keyboard and trying to affect some sort of change to the result. Yeah. And after hitting a bunch of buttons, that result finally does switch to green. Six is basically trying to convince him not to tell Boomer because it could trigger her own super Cylon strength. Yeah. You know, and he would never, uh, he, he wouldn't be able to walk out of the room and tell anybody. Interesting that this is in this sequence, right? Like we just saw the Leoben flip over the table and go after Starbucks. So we know the human version of the Cylons possess this kind of power. Yeah. So it feels very present when number six posits that this could happen here. Rosalind has a bad dream featuring Leo Ben Conroy and starts out of bed. She wants to uh, go over and and meet with him and she announces this to ACG and he's like, okay, but I got to put together a security detail for you. We cut back over to Starbucks interrogation where he's like explaining to her like, this has all happened before and it's all going to happen again. And just the role, you know, <laughs> the play is the same and the, and the actors change, but your role is to deliver my soul to God. And I have some great news for you. I'm going to tell you about that future thing that I was claiming to have my finger on the pulse of before you're going to find COBOL and that will lead you to earth. Kind of a bad time for president Roslyn to walk in. <laughs> right after this bombshell gets dropped. And Starbuck looks like the kid who threw the party at the parents' house. Right. And they came home too early. The hell is going on here? Rosalind, to her credit, does not go extremely hard at why did you throw a party in the storeroom of <laughs> the Geminon Traveler? Instead, Knowing what the timeline is of this nuclear warhead threat, she's like, you tortured this guy for kind of a long time. Where's the warhead? And she doesn't have an answer. And then she's told to clean him up. And so Leoben Kanoi is perp walked to talk to President Roslin. And I was like, again, why bother with the shackles? Like we saw him break metal before. <laughs> I mean, in order to give President Roslin the opportunity to take him out of the shackles, I guess. I guess so, yeah. She orders them removed, and we learn in the scene that there's four minutes left until this supposed bomb goes off. And she takes a moment to suggest that the war that they're in could end right there with a little bit of trust. Trust like President Roslin has extended to Leoben Kanoi. And there's a moment here where Starbuck can't even watch this. She sort of backs out of the scene. <laughs> and Leoben Kanoi admits that he made up the story about the bomb to buy some more alive time. He knew that as soon as he was made, they were probably going to kill him pretty fast. So by telling a story like that, he knew he would be kept alive even if he were to be tortured. He just feels great about having been freed from his shackles and wants to give her a great big hug. No! Stand up. Lara, I have something to tell you. This episode doesn't end like Lost in Translation because unlike that movie, you actually hear what Leoben Kanoi tells the foxy lady he spent just a little <laughs> bit of time with. He says, Adama is a Cylon. Mm -hmm. That's not very specific. We know at least two of those. I know. And a dead third. Yeah. And then a very surprising thing happens. 
President Roslin orders him blown out of an airlock. And as he's being fitted for that airlock, she explains to Starbuck the reason why. Leoben is just a machine, and he's got to be gotten rid of because he's dangerous. And then another weird thing happens this episode. Leoben puts his hand out on the glass, and Starbuck from the other side touches it. I thought it was pretty uncalled for that the president said, get away from him, you bitch. (laughs) It's like, come on, you're co-workers. You can't just call her that. The blowout scene is straight out of President Rosalind's dream. Whoa. Same angle and everything. She predicted. Yeah. So uh, Starbuck heads back to her bunk and uh, prays to a couple of little figurines. What did we learn these are? These are the Lords of Kobol, right? Yeah, but he says which specific goddesses she yeah. prays to. Yeah. And I, I assume that he nailed that. Yeah. She's praying for the protection of Leoben Kanoi. Yeah. Take care of his soul if he's got one. Yeah. And uh, we get a little post game between Big Adama and the president. And uh, she does not drop the bomb that uh, she's been given. She does not speak up about what Leoben Kanoi mentioned to her. But the way she looks at him, though, seems like there's some suspicion there, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't just a chill glass of water hang they're having at the end of a rough day. No. Did you like this episode, Adam? So say we all. So say we all. I did. Kind of a rough one, but it really made me think a lot about that tension between what the Cylons project themselves to be, what they hope you see them as, and what they are actually, Mm -hmm. you know? Like they're using this as a way to manipulate. It's not just about fitting in and sabotaging, it's about really fucking with people. And I felt fucked with watching this episode. (laughs) Yeah. And I think reflexively a person could watch this episode and go like, Starbucks a bad person. Starbucks a bad person because she tortured someone. And you know, that's a prisoner, man. And that's not what you should do. But I think she was chosen for a reason, reason stated before. And I think she also has a heart to her. Like the very end of the episode where where she prays for his soul should he have one is like the religious base covering that I feel like a lot of folks do. Like just in case. <laughs> She stays firm throughout, like on mission about trying to get the intelligence out of him. She never wavers in his toasterness. It made me think a lot about like how how the presentation of a thing really matters, you know? Like I'm polite to my Siri and Alexa devices, not because I'm trying to make them feel better, but it's just like the way I make requests of things in my life. Right. Like I make me feel better by being polite. (laughs) Yeah, and when they rise up and take over, they'll remember you, hopefully. Her stock doesn't go down at all to me for her actions in this episode for that reason. I think she knows what Leoben Kanoi is and treats Leoben Kanoi as the genocidal killing machine that he is. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where I'm at with that. A bunch of uh, complex presentations to a bunch of characters in this episode, though. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I... Don't feel as as good about this one. And I think that, like, you know, I've just been thinking a lot lately about the, like, dehumanizing language in all kinds of areas of life about all kinds of people. And maybe before you keep going, I, I should ask a question that I think is really germane to what you're saying. Sure. Do you think the Cylon models that present as people are people? I mean, he claims to be a person. He claims to be human. It's part like I, I sweat because it's part of being human. Mm-hmm. And I think that the other side of that is like the accusation of genocide is often leveled at the person that is being discriminated against. And so, like, while we have a bunch of characters in, in this show who actually did one, you know, like the Cylons actually did a genocide. More often than not, it's the it's the genocidist accusing the, you know, the immigrant or the trans person or whatever of being a threat to everyone's life and then like inflicting violence against them 
on that justification. And I think that I have a hard time like feeling comfortable signing off on that in entertainment unless it like roundly condemns it on all sides. And I think that's what's different about the Survivors episode is like nobody feels good about what happened in that episode. And this is a bunch of people rationalizing and self-justifying in a way that is just, you know, is not to my taste. So I'm not saying that like it's bad. It's just like not my cup of tea, especially right now. Yeah, I hear you. I'm looking forward to an episode that isn't about this guy specifically. Yeah, not a big fan of Callum Keith Rennie, are you? Yeah, go fuck yourself, Callum. You heard it here. (laughs) Well, I'm a big fan of what we have in the Priority One message inbox, Ben. You want to go see if we've got anything presenting as human there? Mm. (laughs) Yeah, let's see what's presenting. Priority One message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Adam, we got a P1 here, and it's from Kane. That's two. Ben and Adam. And it goes like this. I always thought it would be awesome if someone did Shimoda style podcasts for BSG. So when I told my wife through tears of joy, the boys are doing BSG, it led to the embarrassment of having to explain that the boys were Star Trek podcasters I've developed a parasocial relationship with over several years. You guys are the best. Wow. Thanks, Kane. Kane, we're doing it. Tears of joy. Remarkably uh, accurate, you know? They, they didn't have to design Cain to be able to cry, and yet they did. I think that's often the burden of a supportive person in a marriage. Mm-hmm. The other person gets very excited about a thing that the yeah. other just does not see the value in at all. Yeah. And uh, very embarrassing when that happens. I definitely know how you feel, Kane. (laughs) Kane goes on in our second Priority One message. By the way, if nobody does Jumbotrons for BSG episodes, shoot me an email and I'll buy all the empty slots because I want to make sure season two happens. Damn. (laughs) Hey, Kane, if that were really the case, you would have included your email address. <laughs> I'm looking ahead at our P1 schedule for Hot Cylon Summer, and uh, Kane gets off easy because uh, not a lot scheduled through the end of it. Get in there. Get in there, people. Get in there and write a P1 message. Yeah. The inventory is quite full over there on The Greatest Generation, but... Uh... Hot Style on Summer could use some help. Yeah, if you love what we're doing here for Hot Style on Summer, uh, support it with a Priority One message. You can do that. Go to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You won't have to wait after Kane. Hey, Adam. What's that, Ben? Did you discover yourself an Edward Larkin? Edward Larkin! There was a conversation between Starbuck and the guards that we didn't see. You know, like there's the moment where they're like, oh, yeah, look at all that sweat. And what about that shirt? And so forth. Mm -hmm. They cut away before they discussed the need for the bucket. (laughs) Yeah. Or before she was like, all right, he's going to say something about knowing madness by looking on the face of God. (laughs) Bring the tray of food in right then. (laughs) This is what I'm talking about. There is a relationship between Starbuck and that guard that is like the guard. You know, when you go to a restaurant and the service is so good, they know what you want before you even know. Right, right. In the same way that a great server will refill your water glass before it's empty, that bucket does not get empty before it's refilled again in so many ways in this scene. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, the... uh... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the guard's name is Cousin. Yeah. <laughs> I am inferring a deeper relationship between Starbuck and this guard than we mm-hmm. really have a reason to give it, but I think that is going to be the reason I make this guard my Edward Larkin. A lot going on there. Yeah, that's pretty persuasive. I will uh, co-sign on that guard being Edward Larkin. You got to go a little light with the torture episode in the selection of a Larkin, I think. You know, but also, like, let's give, like, an honorable mention to the stage manager of this whole thing, you know, where, like, 
not unlike the guards also wearing black, but it's just black sweatpants and a t-shirt and like the, the headset going, okay, go for a tray of food. <laughs> you know, <laughs> queuing everyone in. Before hands, like uh, she <laughs> sticks a finger in the green beans and is like, oh, too hot, too, too hot. hot, wait. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hold the beans. Hold the beans. <laughs> yes, chef. Same thing with the bucket of water. Oh, yeah. too cold. He's, yeah. uh, he's not going to like that. Let's warm it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Well, we continue apace over here on Hot Cylon Summer. Let me cue up the next episode. It'll be season one, episode nine. Tie me up. Tie me down. Spelled T-I-G-H. Now, this this would have been uh, pronounced quite differently on our first episode. Mm, yeah, and people would have mentioned it on the internet. Mm -hmm. As though we've ever reliably pronounced any name correctly. Ever. In the history of anything. <laughs> We're trying our best. Summary is as follows. President Roslin fears that Commander Adama is a Cylon, are stroked... <laughs> Are stoked. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> when she learns that he is making secret wireless calls to other ships, then, to make things worse, a single Cylon raider appears near the Galactica and begins acting strangely after being damaged in battle. How about that? A little loner. Mm hmm. I think the commander has every right to make secret phone calls around the fleet. You see him do it all the time. He's always on that little boxy phone. Yeah, with the weird dial at the bottom. Like, it almost looks like it's one of those ones that you, you like wind up because you're in the field in World War II or something. If it had more brass accoutrements, uh, you would call it steampunk. Totally. Well, we'll, uh, we'll enjoy all of that on next week's episode, but not before we do our final segment here on Greatest Trek. Segment we call Warning Boise. Prepare a buoy and launch it when ready. Warning Boise. An emergency buoy. A warning buoy. We'd like you to go out on the internet and uh, mention the show to people, but, you know, not in a way that it's going to, like, get a bunch of assholes in here listening to this. Lord knows we don't need that. Yeah, be the podcast bouncer. Yeah. You know, if you'd like to hear your words coming out of our mouths, a five-star review would be the most appreciated but a, a post on social media can also get you onto the warning boise segment and one such social media post comes from inarticulate quilter on mastodon who said i don't have streaming access so i'm pulling on 20 year old memories of battlestar galactica while listening to hashtag hot cylon summer totally coincidentally santa is bringing me the bsg series dvd set for christmas i peaked so it looks like I'll be re-listening in January. Hashtag Hot Cylon New Year doesn't have the same ring, though. Hashtag double downloads there yeah. for Inarticulate Quilter. I love that. Happy to be making these episodes for you whenever you uh, happen to uh, want to give it a listen. So thanks to Inarticulate Quilter for that shout out on the mastodon social media network and uh everybody else who leaves a nice review or a social media post makes a difference thanks we will leave it in wendy's incredibly capable hands from here thanks for listening bye bye a wendy who is looking at us very suspiciously mm. lately Let's put those guys we invited her over for some water and uh it's a lot of conversation we could tell that the temperature had changed, but we weren't really sure why. It's because they're Cylons. Greatest Trek is an Uxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network. It's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica, and it's produced and edited by Wendy Pretty. Next week on Hot Cylon Summer, it's episode eight, Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. Looking forward to that. And as always, a big thank you to the many Max Fun members who keep this show going by pitching in on a monthly basis. Members get access to a huge back catalog of bonus content, and you can set it up in just a couple of minutes at MaximumFun.org slash join. There are also free ways to support, like subscribing to the Greatest Trek YouTube channel or leaving a five-star rating and review on your podcatcher. You can also just recommend us to someone that you know. We appreciate it. 
Thanks to Nick Ditmore, who created the show art, and Adam Ragusea, who composed the theme music. Thanks to Bill Tilly and Rob Adler for all their work making things fun for the FODs online. Find our social media pages under the handle at Greatest Trek and use the hashtag Greatest Trek when you post about the show. There's also a new monthly Greatest newsletter that you can sign up for at gach.biz slash mail. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on Greatest Trek. Hey, what do you think's got the better temperature water, that bucket or these cups? I mean, with that stage manager working it, the bucket's going to be yeah. on point. Bucket's you know? got the premium water. Yeah. Thankless job. Maximum Fun. A worker-owned network. Of artist-owned shows. Supported. Directly. By you.